passage this morning. Well, I'm going to read in the, uh, a little bit uh, later on, well, not a little bit later on from Esther 4. So if you want to have that ready, uh, you can. We're uh, continuing on in the series in uh, prayer. Last week we had prayer and worship. Uh, today it's uh, maybe a tougher uh, combination of prayer and fasting. Um, yeah, I'll just stick with this. I've forgotten to put the head mic on, but I'll just stick with this one if that's okay. So, Youth for Christ. don't know how many of you know Youth for Christ, the, the organization. This is the international organization, Youth for Christ. Uh, back in January, they issued a call to pray and to fast. And these are the terms uh, which the call came on their website. Uh, we pray and fast because prayer catalyzes mission and empowers evangelism. In prayer, you get hold of God, but more importantly, God gets hold of you. And we in this season have the opportunity to reach tens of thousands of lost teenagers, proving to be the greatest youth revival in history. In no other time have we as Youth for Christ been positioned globally to reach and impact lost teenagers with the gospel of Jesus. We're calling you to pray and fast with us on the first Monday of every month so that lost youth can come to know and be transformed by Jesus. Now, maybe that sounds really exciting to you if you have a particular call to, to young people. Maybe that sounds a bit crazy and uncomfortable. Uh, I know some Christians who think that praying is a little bit crazy and uncomfortable, but I'm sure that's none of us here. Uh, yet, we might view fasting in those terms as a little bit kind of extreme, a little bit out there, a little bit like shaving your head or walking on hot coals, uh, you know, a little bit like that, these kind of bizarre things that people do for different reasons. And yet, fasting is a biblical practice with radically, that radically challenges mainstream Western fast food consumer culture. Well, let's have the reading. Uh, it's from Esther 4, as I said earlier. Uh, so if you've got a Bible, you might like to, to look at that he, uh, just now. It'll be up on the screen as well. And, and this is a story in which fasting plays a very significant uh, role. So from verse 1. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing and loudly and bitterly. Should say that in Persia, in Susa, the capital, uh, a proclamation had just been made uh, to destroy the Jewish people. So it was pretty serious. Verse 2. Uh, he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. Uh, in every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. Esther was Mordecai's niece, uh, but also she was the queen of Persia. She sent clothes for Mordecai to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy 
and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. And then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three day, days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. The story in that chapter, and really the whole of Esther, but this is the critical part of the book, is one of national crisis for the Jews. And uh, that's an experience they have had again and again over the centuries. Uh, Esther was the beautiful young queen of the Persian emperor Xerxes, round about 470 BC, uh, at the time of the exile of the people of Israel, first in Babylon, but then taken over by the Persian uh, empire. And under the influence, the evil influence of Haman, the king had been persuaded to issue this decree of destruction against the Jews, unaware of his wife's Jewish heritage. Her uncle Mordecai, who was the source of Haman's hatred for the Jews, then calls Esther to action, that she should speak to the king, even though this could lead to her own death, because you couldn't just walk in uh, and speak without being called, unless, of course, he uh, accepted your presence by uh, putting out his golden scepter to you. And Mordecai calls her to action, potentially sacrificial action, with this famous call in verse 14. Who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And Esther responds by confronting the king, and ultimately her people are saved from destruction. And threaded through this story of Esther is a spiritual response to the events that unfold, which draws God into the equation, makes it clear that the people don't expect anything good to happen unless God is involved and unless they fast. Firstly, after the edicts pronounced, uh, there was great mourning, we're told, among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and, and ashes. So there was a, a huge outpouring of grief amongst all of the Jewish people, uh, and part of that was fasting. Fasting was an integral part of their expression of grief and anguish and pain, communicating to God how serious their situation was. And then secondly, following the call to Esther to speak, she responds to Mordecai and says, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. And this is a serious fast. She says, don't 
eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. A key moment had arrived for action, and they, as God's people, needed to demonstrate to him how serious the situation was, and they did so by fasting from food and drink for three whole days. Now, prayer, is, prayer in fact, is not actually mentioned in the passage, but presumably it's assumed that that is one of the things that they would do while they were fasting, that they would pray at the same time. And as a result of, of Esther going to the king, as a result of the fasting and prayer and um, laying hold of God, God's people see a great deliverance from their enemies uh, in uh, the story of Esther. It's a great book, worth reading the whole thing if, if you don't know it that well. Now, I wonder if there's ever been any circumstances in your life where you've faced some really serious personal issues, or maybe together as God's people that have been such a cause for concern that you or we together have fasted and prayed in anticipation of God intervening on our behalf as he did then. You know, maybe you don't think anything that's happened in your life has, has been quite as serious as that, like the entire destruction of their people. Maybe you still think even then that fasting is, is still pretty kind of extreme. It's a little bit fanatical. Perhaps as someone said to me not so long ago, I tried it once, but it didn't really, I didn't really enjoy it. Well, I, I'm not sure you really do it to enjoy it, so what is the point of fasting? What is it? What is fasting? Uh, there's a definition I came across by an American writer called Don Whitney, where it just simply put it as a Christian's voluntary abstinence from food for spiritual purposes. Uh, now, I know that uh, the kind of uh, period of Lent, which uh, we don't make a big deal of, generally speaking, in our tradition, but some traditions make a big deal of Lent, which is the 40 days roughly from Shrove Tuesday through to Good Friday, uh, that fasting's kind of extended, the net's kind of pushed a bit wider, and it might include things like fasting from talking, uh, fasting from sleeping, I think that sounds a bit dangerous, fasting from television, fasting from social media. Uh, I've heard quite a common one, which is a food-related thing, fasting from chocolate. I've heard that being something people do during Lent. Uh, and there may be value in these things, fasting from these things over Lent. Uh, but it is only fasting from food and drink that has a biblical tradition. Uh, and fasting in the Bible ranges from fasting from food and drink for short periods, such as here, uh, Paul, in Acts 9, uh, at the time of his conversion on the Damascus Road, he didn't eat and drink until Ananias turned up. Supernaturally, for longer periods, Moses and Elijah, who fasted for 40 days. Uh, and that ranges also to partial fasts, uh, such as the dietary limitations placed on themselves by Daniel and his friends at the beginning of the exile in Babylon. The normal model in the New Testament is from food, but not usually from drink, from water. In the New Testament, it's, it tends to be very much a private matter, practiced on an occasional basis for some specific purpose. So why, why do we fast? Why should we fast? Jesus himself fasted from food for 40 days in the lead up to his temptation in the desert by the devil. Uh, and I'm sure part of that was to seek the Father's strengthening and deliverance from that uh, challenge that he faced uh, in the early part of his ministry. Uh, on two occasions, Jesus taught on fasting. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 and following, uh, he said, when you fast, 
Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show that others that they're fasting. Uh, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who's unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So it isn't a command to fast in those words, but uh, there is an implicit assumption that Jesus' disciples will do this from time to time. Uh, Jesus makes it pretty clear in there that, that, that your motive for fasting is uh, critical, uh, and that is that fasting should be God-centered and not self-centered and certainly not to impress other people about how spiritual you are. Uh, and so, most of all, it should really be a private thing between ourselves uh, and God, though private, I'm sure, could extend to include uh, the, the local church, you know, fasting together for some uh, key issue. But the individual, it's a private thing, uh, not to impress other people. Uh, the second part of te Jesus' teaching is in Matthew chapter 9 from verse 14. Uh, an occasion when John's disciples came and asked Jesus, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. Again, it's not an explicit command to fast, but Jesus does seem to expect that his disciples, this will be something that they will do after his death. It was certainly something that Paul practiced uh, even beyond his conversion experience uh, when he and Barnabas uh, were commissioned uh, for their missionary activity. They fasted and prayed when they, were, when they appointed elders in some of the churches that they uh, began in different places, they would fast uh, in that process of, of making those decisions. So that's some of the reasons why we might do it. What, what value does it have? Well, eating, of course, is a natural part of human life. It's something that we all do every day, at least three times a day, breakfast, lunch, uh, and dinner. I'm sure that uh, maybe we fill in the gaps as well along the way. And so to the world, Fasting, unless it's maybe for to lose weight or for medical reasons, probably seems a little bit unnatural and abnormal, which is why we might think it's a little bit extreme. However, Christian fasting is not intended to be a physical activity. It's primarily to be a spiritual activity. Uh, in fasting, uh, a hunger for food is, is used as a means to enhance our hunger for God. Uh, Jesus, when he was being tempted by the devil in Matthew 4, uh, says to him, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so when we're fasting, when we have thoughts about food, which I'm sure will happen on a regular basis, especially maybe for some of us, those thoughts about food should really prompt thoughts about God. You know, if you forget why you're doing it, when you feel hungry, you say, all right, yes, I'm, I'm fasting. I need to focus myself on God. I need to pray about that issue. I'm, I'm, I'm the reason I'm fasting. Hunger pangs should, be an, should act as a reminder to us to pray because typical prayer and fasting will go hand in hand. What are the dangers? Uh, certainly physically, uh, I think it's kind of recommended if you're, pregnant, or if you're diabetic, or if you have a heart condition, then maybe you just need to be careful, get some advice maybe from uh, uh, your doctor or a medical friend uh, about whether it's appropriate to you. There are dangers spiritually uh, as well, because clearly we must have right motives. As, as Jesus said, like the Pharisees fasted all the time, and yet for many of them, it didn't seem to help in any way whatsoever. Our focus should be on God when we fast, not on ourselves or to impress other people. 
Uh, it's certainly to receive a blessing, maybe an answer to prayer, but not to manipulate God into uh, responding to our demands. Uh, we should remember it's a privilege uh, to fast, not an obligation, uh, or it could become a burden to us. Uh, we should certainly avoid any sense of empty ritual in fasting and, uh, and only really do it for a clear and specific purpose. Well, what purpose does it have? Firstly, I think fasting allows us to, to express a right attitude towards God, His purposes, and ourselves. As far as God is concerned, it's an act of worship. So, in a sense, it links into a little bit with what was said last week. And, you know, we're talking about sung praise last week in terms of what Michael was sharing with us, but this is praise in its own way. It's worship, uh, demonstrating our love and our commitment towards God. Um, it re kind of jigs our perspective in terms of God's purposes in the world. Uh, through fasting, we can express a particular concern for God's plan for our world and its outworking. And, and that certainly is what's behind the Youth for Christ challenge in January this year. It's, you know, they're, through their fasting, expressing a concern for God's plan for young people in our world, which is a really good thing to pray and fast about. In, in many ways, it, it's a rejection of what is wrong in our world and it is uh, an identification with those who suffer in our world as you suffer uh, by not eating. There's an identification with those that don't even have enough food, for example, to eat and sustain life. It, it shifts our thinking about ourselves, and, and that can happen in a number of ways through the fact that we can express grief maybe at our circumstances, grief at our failures. It can be expression of repentance, a turning back to God. It, it can be express our humility before God. So, it can be used as an, in a number of ways just to shift our thinking about ourselves too. In Esther's circumstances, fasting expressed the people's pain at their dire situation potential destruction of the entire race in that region of that part of the empire, and their complete reliance on God for deliverance. If nothing happened, they were all going to die. And they laid before God the importance of His plan for His people, which this edict would undermine. For themselves, there was also a clear determination to turn back to God, to seek His will for the outcome in this situation. Uh, so, fasting assists us in, in reconfiguring, reconfiguring ourselves, our perspective, our attitudes towards God. And part of that is by just pushing us out of our normal routine. Uh, probably our day's routine is kind of um, divided up by our meals. So we get up, we have breakfast, we do our morning stuff, we have lunch, we do our afternoon stuff, we have dinner, we do our evening stuff, then we go to sleep. Uh, and so it very much orders our day eating. But if we're spending a day fasting, then those kind of traditional parts of our day are no longer there. Uh, maybe the, those are the times you could potentially spend in prayer. So it completely turns our daily routine on its head in a positive way. So those days are different. Um, fasting strengthens our prayers, demonstrates the seriousness of the issue, not just to God, but to us too. It's helpful when we're seeking guidance, maybe about some big decision. Uh, about some key shift maybe in our lives. It can be dedicating ourselves at, at some significant moment in our life uh, when we see a real shift, something happening, something big, we might fast and pray about it. Maybe seeking protection from persecution and temptation. 
maybe expressing grief at the loss of something in our lives, the loss of someone in our lives. So a number of reasons that we might fast. So what about us today? Is this something we could respond to, something we could do ourselves? Well, clearly we're not in the situation that Esther was in. Uh, that was pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, and repeated just 70 years ago for the Jews with the attack of the Nazi regime. There's just some pretty horrific parallels. And of course, many of them did, millions of them did die in, in that situation. But maybe we know people who are in personally uh, as difficult a situation as that. Uh, just to share one idea that Karina and I have had, I know it's supposed to be private, but just uh, for, by way of illustration, uh, we have a connection with a, a, a man, Ian, who's in uh, open conditions down at Greenock Prison. He was initially given a sentence of four years, but I think now he's probably been in jail for about 16 years. Uh, the reason for that is because, although he was given a four-year sentence, um, it was a life sentence. Uh, and so life does, in a sense, really mean life, in the sense that, you know, somebody's got to decide to release you. Uh, and even once you're released, you could be pulled back for just about any reason. Um, Ian's been helping uh, four days a week at Glasgow City Mission and is just doing tremendously well and has so much to offer. Uh, and there's a day coming in November, I think it's the 6th, when the parole board will be meeting to decide on his case again. Uh, so we're hoping it's going to be a little bit like Red in Shawshank Redemption. You remember he was every year he went to the parole board and every year it was denied. <laughs> uh, and then he went in one day and just told them what he thought of them. And he was released. <laughs> so we're just praying that uh, November 6th it will be Ian's uh, freedom from captivity. Uh, maybe we are in circumstances which are serious for us in personal terms. Could be some financial issue that we face. Could be some relationship difficulty that we're struggling with and there seems no way out. Could be some, you know, in terms of God's direction for our, our life, in terms of job, career, you know, whatever, ministry. And we just don't know what it is God has for us. Could be that we want to say some, lay some national or global matter before the Lord in a very serious way. Way. Tonight, I think at prayer space, we're praying for the nation. Uh, there's lots of things of real significance in our nation uh, to pray for. Uh, there was a recent movie, I'm not sure it's still on release, Dunkirk. Uh, Karina and I so wanted to go and see it, but we never quite got <laughs> the evening to do that. So we didn't see it, but we know one or two people who have. We know the story pretty much, which is that there were like 340,000 British troops stuck, trapped uh, in France, uh, being surrounded by the uh, Nazi forces uh, back in May 1940. And of course, uh, this is a spoiler alert, they were all saved. <laughs> but I'm sure you know that already. Uh, but one of the significant things which you can see in the pictures, I've got uh, King George V, sixth, sorry, King George VI, in the middle, doing a radio broadcast. The king called the nation to prayer on May the 26th. Uh, now, it was, a, it was a call to prayer, but I would think that some of the people that day would have fasted as well. Um, I think Rosanne shared uh, two or three weeks ago that you know, her family, like they were atheists, and they never went to church, but they went to church and prayed on May the 26th. I don't suppose you fasted. That might have been just a bit of a step too far for your parents. But I'm sure that um, some people would have fasted that day. And of course, we know that most of those trips were recovered by a, an armada of naval ships and civilian ships and boats, little boats. And so many people saw that as a miracle, as an answer to prayer you know, at a level of, of what Esther and Mordecai experienced in Persia. Prayer, backed up, amplified by fasting. Well, I wonder, 
just as we close, what great move of God would you like to see? Could be a great move of, of God in your, li- your own life, you know, something you've been really struggling with or some opening you're, you're hoping for a, a door to open. Uh, it could be something in your family. Maybe there's somebody that, you know, has, is, is, not, is not in a place of faith and you just desperately long to see them come to a faith in Christ. It could be something bigger in terms of the community, the nation, the world. There's lots of things to pray about in our world today. It could be something like Youth for Christ, the youth of our world. So many big, big, big things that we could pray for, but personal stuff too. What move of God would you long to see uh, in your lifetime? Perhaps the breakthrough uh, will come as you pray and fast. Remember the big struggle that the disciples had one day uh, with a demon-possessed man you know, they, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and nothing happened. Uh, and Jesus' response to them was, well, this type only comes out through prayer and fasting. Uh, so maybe there's certain things, certain answers to prayer that uh, we need to get really serious and add fasting to our prayer to see that breakthrough. So maybe, maybe that you have been called to pray and to fast as part of your royal position as disciples of Jesus for such a time as this. Shall we pray? Father, um, you know, maybe some of us here are thinking, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get out there and fast and pray this week. Uh, about something. Maybe for some of us, it's, it's, it's something we already do, but it's just help us refocus on wh- why we're doing it and, and what the purpose of it is and, and really to kind of rededicate ourselves to it. Maybe for others here, it's like something they've never done or maybe done once and it just didn't work for them. Lord, uh, this is clearly something that is, you know, important because Jesus taught about it. Jesus himself did it. Uh, and so this is something that you would have for us. Lord, I pray that every single one of us would you know, think, well, what, what is going on in my life or not happening in my life that I could be praying and fasting ab- about on a regular basis just to demonstrate my seriousness, the seriousness of my heart for this, my desperation to see an answer to that prayer, a yes to that prayer. Lord, just speak to us each of us, maybe individually, maybe as a church community, to call us to pray and to fast, to see you turn up and our world changed. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.